All right, thank you for joining us at this sold out screening. We're very excited. Uh, my name is Keith Benny. I'm the acting director of Learning here at TIFF. It's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's special event, the world premiere of Five at 50, an intimate look at contemporary LGBTQ2 plus lives and identities. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge where tonight's event is taking place. We're on the treaty territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation and the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and the Huron-Wendat. We are grateful to have the opportunity to work in the community, and we are committed to showing films made by Indigenous creators. Please join us when we present The Body Remembers When the World Broke Open, a collaboration with Alamaya Tailfeathers and Kathleen Hepburn about one woman's decision to confront a stranger that leads to a powerful conversation between two Indigenous women from very different circumstances. Uh, I encourage you to come out to see this amazing film. It will play here at TIFF from December 13th to December uh, 19th. Please visit our website for more information. Um, as tonight is a very special event, I have a number of important thank yous, so please bear with me. Um, first, on behalf of TIFF, I'd like to thank our lead sponsor, Bell, our major sponsors, RBC, L'Oreal Paris, and Visa, as well as our major public supporters, the Government of Canada, the Government of Ontario, and the City of Toronto. Uh, thank you, of course, too, to our members and our donors for supporting TIFF's year-round learning programs. Uh, a big thank you, of course, to our presenting partner tonight, the National Film Board of Canada, uh, and our media partner, uh, Extra Magazine, for making tonight's event possible. Um, I also want to give a shout out to our community partners who are here tonight, uh, our Planned Parenthood Toronto, the Inside Out Film Festival, the 519, Black Woman Film Canada, and supporting our youth who are joining us here tonight. Let's give them a big round of applause. Uh, it takes a village to present an event like this, and so thank you to all of the partners who have contributed to make uh, event, uh, the event tonight so special. Um, so tonight we are thrilled and honored to have as our moderator and our host the amazing Rachel Giza. Uh, Rachel, yes, please, Rachel. Uh, Rachel is an award-winning author and journalist and the uh, editorial director of Extra Magazine, an online publication um, covering LGBTQ2 politics and culture. Her best-selling book, Boys, What It Means to Become a Man, won the Writers' Trust Shaughnessy Cohen Prize for Political Writing. Rachel will join us after the screening uh, to moderate the conversation. Uh, so back in May, I had a phone call with Justine Pimlot, the producer of the films you're about to see. Um, yes. <laughs> Uh, and she told me about these incredible projects, the roster of artists that she had lined up, um, and how each of them were responding to the invitation to reflect on 50 years since the passing of Bill C-150, which partially um, decriminalized homosexuality in Canada. Six months later, and we're all here tonight uh, because of the hard work of Justine and her artists, um, and we're thrilled and honored to be working with the NFB to share these films with you tonight. So to introduce the screening, as well as the creators behind these works, please join me in welcoming the producer of Five at 50, Justine Pimlot. Uh, thank you so much, Keith, and thank you to uh, the whole team at uh, TIFF Adult Learning. Um, I'm over 50, so I'm going to put my glasses on and read my thank yous. <laughs> um, I, I just want to, you know, as, as Keith said, it takes a village, and uh, so I want to thank all of you for being here. Um, I, this project is, you know, uh, in my heart. And, uh, you know, as a longtime queer person, um, you know, it's just very, very special to me. Um, so, you know, I would really like to acknowledge my team at the National Film Board Ontario studio. Uh, everybody there works so very hard, and this is a group and a team effort. I would like to thank my executive producer, Anita Lee, uh, for your ongoing support and wisdom. Uh, my production quarter, Andrew Martin-Smith, uh, my, uh, our production supervisor, Marcus Mateus, student administrator, Patricia Bourgeois, our studio uh, operations manager, Mark Wilson, our tech coordinator, Kevin Riley. I want to thank um, my marketing uh, team, our marketing team, not my, our, um, Melissa Wheeler and colleagues, Michelle Roson and Hannah Martin for all of your hard work. And there are also so many cast and crew here tonight. Uh, and my thanks to you, and we're going to get to thank all of you individually, I promise you. Um, and 
Now, last but certainly not least, I want to uh, thank from the bottom of my heart our filmmakers. Our, my collab our collaboration uh, was very special, and, um, and I feel so much gratitude to all of you. And I'd like to introduce each one of you and have you come up, uh, Vivek Shreya. And Michael V. Smith. Uh, Michelle Pearson Clark. <laughs> Tiffany Shung and Thurza Cuthand. So uh, is this working? Yeah. Um, if any of you, there's people you want to thank in the audience before we start the screening. Hi. <laughs> um, I, first, I want to give a shout out to um, all of my Edmonton people in the crowd because uh, my film is about a gay bar in Edmonton. So Edmonton, uh, this, is for, this is for us. Anyone else who's from Edmonton? Yes, OK, well. Hello, fam. Um, I really want to give a big shout out to uh, Tim Singleton. I don't know where you are, Tim, but Tim did. Hi, Tim. Uh, Tim did the amazing animation for my film. Also, uh, did this beautiful artwork here. This film wouldn't be possible without Tim. So, thank you so much, Tim. And also, want to shout out uh, Johnny Spence, who did the incredible music, um, and um, Justine, of course. So much for uh, including me this in this incredible um, lineup and the NFB team, and particularly um, Andy for like the thousands of emails that went back and <laughs> forth. Thank you so much for being so good at what you do. I want to thank all the same people. Justine has been really amazing. She was so kind and generous with her time and her heart, and that made a big difference for me, uh, never having made a film of this budget, let's say, magnitude. Um, and I really want to thank Andy and the whole team at NFB. They were amazing. I, I don't have, I'm a BC filmmaker, and I don't have anybody in the audience. Uh, so fuck, <laughs> fuck Edmonton. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's on camera. Beep Edmonton. I, that's fine. I love Edmonton. Uh, <laughs> I do, I do. I had a great time in Edmonton. <laughs> it's where I saw drag queens with poppers. Who doesn't love both those things? Uh, but I have some uh, Toronto filmmaker friends here who I love, and I'm so glad you came. Anyways, I'm the funny one of the bunch. Uh, thank you so much for coming, everybody. Um, my film is about my marriage and my divorce, so I want to thank my ex-wife, Nurserine Khan, for allowing me to speak about my experience of that. Um, I want to thank uh, my participants. I spoke with six friends, and their vulnerability and honesty is what makes my film what it is. So thank you, Russell Matthew and Scott Ferguson. Thank you, Ross Burnett and Nick Hanning. And thank you, Rachel Giza and Jen Miller. I also want to thank my creative collaborator, my cinematographer, Alyssa Bistonath. Um, my editor is not here, my assistant editor, Jordan Kawai, and also my gaffer, Cheska. So, and Justine, friend, thank you for uh, pushing me. You know I struggled with this film, and uh, thanks for pushing me across the finish line. <laughs> um, Justine. <laughs> Thank gonna, you. You guys are going to make me cry. No, but the truth <laughs> is I never thought that I had the capacity or um, the ability to share a story like this. And if it wasn't for you, if it wasn't for that conversation and the ongoing encouragement and support, a lot of the, it was challenging. And thank you so, so much for never giving up and being so patient with me and so supportive creatively, emotionally on this very, very challenging, but um, I'm very, very proud of what we were able to do. So thank you so much, Justine, for creating that space for me. Um, thank you so much to everyone at the NFB, Anita Lee, thank you for those great conversations that we had. Um, Marcus, Andy, oh my God, I'm so sorry I put you through all those releases. <laughs> I am so, so sorry, I love you, Andy. 
Tiffany B. I know this is like, I don't know why this is getting so emotional, but thank you, my friend, for those. We miss pride, half a pride by editing this. We missed Maya live. Um, thank you, Tiff, for your <laughs> ongoing support through everything and your friendship. Jennifer Kasabian can be here, but she also contributed so much to the process of creating the script. And Alex Tong, I know I saw you. Thank you, Alex. Daniela, I'm not sure if she was here as well, but thank you so much to my incredible team, um, everyone that was supportive throughout the whole process. and. Um, Victoria, I promise I'm not gonna publicly propose to you for the sixth time. <laughs> I love you so much for allowing me to have the space to even have this conversation and delve into this. Why aren't you looking at me? <laughs> Look at me! <laughs> I love you and I know eventually we will lock down that date. To my, to my family, uh, my mother and father can be here, and, but I know my cousins and I think my brother's here, but thank you to my family for their unconditional love throughout the 18 years of me being out. I really appreciate it. It means the world to me. Thank you. Um, so first of all, I'm gonna thank everybody in the credits just so that I hopefully have covered them all um, without actually going into everybody in the credits. I'm just gonna like pick out some people that I can recognize immediately. So Maria, my editor is over there and she was amazing to work with. Um, Kylie May, our actress um, was also incredible. Um, my Auntie Beth who is not here, who tells the story um, is, is just, she has just been such a loving presence in my life. And um, she's my only, link to the story that my grandfather had. So um, so it's really important that she was involved. Um, who else do I want to thank? Uh, Gabriella, our DOP, and um, everybody who helped basically, and Justine who, um, <laughs> who trusted me enough even though it was a very experimental doc and like did not quite understand where my vision was going but trusted we would get there. I'm glad you helped me get there. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I, there's just one more person. I wanted to thank Ricardo Acosta um, for your mentoring and story lab work with, with us. Thank you so much. And, and we'll, we'll be back after the film. Hi, everyone. I'm Rachel Giza. I'm from Extra. Um, I have the great pleasure of leading the conversation uh, with these phenomenal filmmakers. Um, and with Justine, we're going to talk for about uh, 20, 25 minutes, then we're going to open it up to you in the audience. Um, and uh, I wanted to add, just uh, in the interest of um, transparency, that that was me in Michelle's film. Um, it wouldn't be a queer event if there wasn't a little bit of incestuous um, <laughs> happening. Um, and uh, so I just wanted to be upfront about that. Um, and uh, I also would just want to uh, say that I'm very delighted. Uh, these films will live on um, on the NFB site. And the NFB has kindly given us permission to also host all of them um, on Extra site. And they'll be up on Thursday, uh, sort of later in the day. So um, you can find them there. So I wanted to start um, with Justine and then open it up to all the filmmakers um, who I think this was the first time all of you have seen each other's work. So, um, so Justine, can you talk a bit about the impetus? Like what, what was the germ of the idea that led to this project? Um, well, uh, anniversaries, um, you know, are really the different anniversaries. So for example, C-150, I mean, I think as queer people, this kind of anniversary is an opportunity to reflect. And um, for me, the impetus was that this anniversary was an opportunity for a, a, uh, to give a platform to hear from multiple vo voices in our communities, um, to uh, reflect on the frame was where, you know, where we've come from, where we are uh, 50 years uh, after this anniversary. And the intent was to keep the frame kind of wide and to really look at it through a contemporary lens. And, uh, and, 
and so that that where the impetus came from. I I, I really feel very strongly like whether it's an anniversary like um, the Canada 150 uh, or C150 uh, or or in this case uh, you know um, C150 that 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 there's mythologies around these anniversaries and and I feel that we need to hear from voices in our in, in our communities um, to um, not you know only uh, perpetuate mythologies but to um, bring our various perspectives you know to these anniversaries so that was where the impetus came from yeah um, and so then I want to hear from each of you, maybe I'll start with you, Vivek. Um, do you have a, okay, you've got a mic. Um, so how quickly did the focus um, and the scope of your film come to mind when Justine approached you about this? And how, how did it come to mind? Like how, what, what were you thinking? <laughs> yeah. um, well, you know, uh, as a queer brown kid who grew up in Edmonton, um, I had a really hard time growing up in Edmonton. And I mean, I think this is the narrative that we hear of small towns um, or smaller cities. Um, we called it Edmonton. Michael, you're not allowed to make that joke. I'm allowed to make that joke. <laughs> of all the things <laughs> I thought was going to tear our communities I know, apart, like Edmonton... I did not think it would be the Vancouver Edmonton beef. I, I didn't even know it was a rivalry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm learning things. Um, but yeah. <laughs> But, you know, when I moved to Toronto, um, especially being in queer community in Toronto, I lived here for 15 years, I started feeling very differently about my home city. And as someone who has been so vocal about the ways that Edmonton has been hard, I do feel a kind of debt um, to talk about the ways that actually Edmonton has been wonderful and has shaped me in, in ways that I'm really grateful to. And so I'd made uh, a project a couple years prior called The Magnificent Malls of Edmonton. It was a zine. There's more than one. <laughs> and um, after that, I really wanted to make a follow-up project about The Roost because this is this gay bar that was sort of like iconic and that we, like something always went down at, a, at The Roost, which I think is like kind of the, the way that gay bars are, especially in smaller towns. It's like, you, um, you know, I think there's something about being forced to be in a space with others who aren't like you in queer community that just spawns a range of experiences. And so I had this idea. And when Justine approached me, I was like, oh, like this has just been sitting here for a while. And maybe it's not a zine and maybe it's um, a short film. And so we kind of went from there. Yeah. Thank you. Um, there's a, how about you? There was a, it was a beautiful story and so, so generous of your aunt to share that with you. So can you talk a bit about how this came together to be this film? Um, yeah, there's like in the indigenous community, there's two spirit people have like, we've been telling people for like years and years that we were like always here and people were like, no, like we don't like, you know, just trying to like deny that we have this history in the indigenous community and that we're like important people. So, um, part of it was like just wanting to prove that we were important. And part of that was going to find, um, an, an oral story that had been passed down through the generations about a two spirit person. And, um, and so I went on Facebook and I like, didn't really know who was going to tell me a story. And I was like, I'm looking for a story. I didn't really like, I just kind of like was like looking for a pre-contact two spirit story. And my auntie was like, Oh, I have a story for you. And, um, yeah, it just was something that my my grandpa, she didn't actually know it was a two spirit person until later when she wanted to do, she wanted to do a book about it. And, um, he was like, my grandpa was reluctant and that's when she found out. Cause in Cree, like you say, he, she, like you just like, you just go back and forth if, if you're like uh, first, if your first language is Cree. Um, so she didn't know that this was like a two spirited person. And um, yeah, so I had my story. Um, I'm hoping, I'm hoping it proves something finally. So yeah. Great. Michelle. Um, well, for me, all of my work is about grief and loss in some way. Um, and like I think I said it in the film when I was thinking about, okay, the last 50 years and my own life in in relationship to all the changes and things that have happened. And because I was uh, uh, early to get married and early to get divorced, it just felt like an obvious thing for me to take up um, as a topic for the film. Yeah. Um, and, oh, do you have a mic? Me. Um, 
like, uh, I mean, it's, I'm, I am curious, I want to ask all of you and throw it out at all of you after this, sort of what your impressions were of each other's work, but it's interesting the way I think, um, I got to see all of them before this and how much I felt that these were in conversations. And I think your and Michelle's film are in some way kind of paired to me in that they're about the domestic and they're about, um, about how we form relationships when suddenly we have legal recognition or these mechanisms to, you know, um, and so yours also is very personal. Thank you, Victoria. <laughs> she let go of my uh, hand midway in your film and I, was, I looked at her and she looked at me. <laughs> So can you talk a bit about, um, you know, what you were thinking when you were making this and how this came to be? Well, well first, I want to thank these filmmakers, because when you brought us together, you guys actually encouraged the bravery for me to make a film like this and to share such a personal story, because this is something, this is the first for me to fully kind of come out in like this way. And so knowing all of your works, it's really given me that voice. So I thank you all for sharing your stories and, and creating that space, so thank you. And I miss out a few people in the thank you, and Ricardo, you've always been an incredible, incredible person to be able to collaborate and share, and thank you for supporting this journey as well for me. And I know Priscilla's in the audience, thank you Priscilla, and Tom Third, my composer, thank you for the midnight oil, that was crazy as we finished this off. Um, I wasn't really sure how I was going to share the story, but I, it was true that this bassinet showed up into my house and Victoria didn't tell me and she just came home from uh, Rochester and it was um, a surprise and I thought it was a joke and I thought I could like hide it like most of my feelings, I guess, and I didn't. <laughs> So I literally did stuff it in the closet. And I know a few of the mothers are here in the audience who in fact borrowed this bassinet. I'm sure there's another family out there that's gonna borrow it next week, I believe. It's in my eye calendar. Um, <laughs> so this bassinet's still traveling. And I think for me, it was, I didn't really, I still am processing and it isn't really an ending and I, I still want a dog at the same time. Um, and the process is still ongoing. And I think that I needed to have a platform that has some levity to be able to explore because it is still difficult to be able to say those things, like to say what I feel that might be taking up too much space in my family, even though I've been out for 18 years and my family has embraced um, my queerness, but it's the next level and that next space that is very new to me that makes me feel like I might have to choose between, you know, my cultural upbringing um, and, you know, my, my sexual orientation and my love for Victoria and building a family and what that means. So there is a, there is a weird pressure in society, or uh, not just like, you know, the heteronormative society of baby next, you know, but also, you know, in, in the gay community for me, also is just like not also feeling like I belong either and not knowing where to find that kind of um, knowledge and support around how do you, how do you balance the two? How do you balance the things that you are raised to respect and adopt and appreciate while also still being, you know, gay and proud? And it wasn't until I went to the Canadian Gay Archive that I realized there was not a lot of information amongst, you know, East Asian queer communities that um, it felt like a story that I could slowly, you know, unravel and tell. Thanks. Um, and Michael, yours is um, a really interesting conversation, not just with the audience, but between generations of, of gay men. And I'm, I'm wondering if you could t talk a bit about how this came about and what you were thinking as you were making this film and what you wanted to reflect on this, this anniversary. Well, my initial pitch was to do something because Justine gave us the prompt to think about uh, what's changed. And one of the things I've noticed um, I'm 48 and I came out in the city when I was 19. And so 30 years ago, people acknowledged each other in the world. So queer people would give a little nod or, and there was a whole sort of silent code. And that's partly why, what I liked about cruising was all the codification of behavior. You could have a whole conversation without talking and then some. <laughs> and, Unlike lesbians. 
<laughs> where there's just too much talking. <laughs> And Justine and I talked about that, and out of that conversation, we talked about cruising, and it, we talked about pickup, and then uh, it was really the conversation with Justine that made me think about pick, hookup culture, pickup culture, and how that really has changed dramatically for gay men in the last 50 years. And then when we all got together, I had a rough idea, but brainstorming with the filmmakers, uh, we came up with this idea of two generations, and you get those two generations talking, and then the film sort of played itself out. And this is just sort of throwing it open to everyone, and feel free to grab my mic. Um, having now watched each other's work, has it, do you have sort of any initial impressions about, about, has it made you think about your own work differently or about this broader question of progress and what's changed and what gets lost um, um, when things change? You may want to leap in. I just want to say that, you know, we, in the early beginning of when we all came together, we, we spent, you know, uh, workshopping and t discussing th the story ideas. So what was interesting is as that that evolved is how the work actually then ended up being creatively, uh, you know, around de queer desire in public spaces and domesticity. And then there's a, you know, pre-contact story, um, you know. And so it was so interesting the way that that evolved creatively, um, you know, in terms of... Um, you know, the, that anniversary being about, you know, in the privacy of your own, you know, bedroom at a certain age of consent. And so it's just, you know, I think that these, the conversation around desire in public, desire in, 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 in domestic spaces and our lives in domestic spaces versus public spaces, and then the erasure of histories, our histories, you know, so it's really uh, very beautiful the way that the, the work emerged, you know, in terms of thematic, thematically. Anybody else want to leap in? Um, I guess I would just say what I appreciate is you use the word reflect, and I do think that within seeing all the five films tonight, I think both internal and external to our community, we have messages um, and a reinforcement of the idea of linear progress um, and that we have to be uh, celebratory and grateful of progress, which we do, but I see opportunity within all of these films to sort of take a moment to, to you know change and progress also means giving up certain things um, it also means losing certain things and it's okay for us to also talk about that and acknowledge that that that's part of you know everything that that has come that has made our lives better we've also lost some things and I think it's okay for us to talk about that and so I appreciate everybody's sort of um, honesty and, and willingness and openness to to open up that space so maybe we could then talk a bit about, um, I think often when there are these sort of milestones and often these milestones are somewhat arbitrary and I think even just the way we sort of the, the very complex way we have to even talk about it's the partial decriminalization of homosexuality between two consenting adults in their own home over the yeah, age of 21, which <laughs> two men. Um, um, so it does become a bit of an arbitrary marker of, of progress, but I think there can often be the sense that, um, you know, progress is just this overall good thing. And, um, uh, but I think that that all of you um, convey a sense of of loss or ambivalence or some critique of that sense. And maybe I can start with you, Vivek, because I think that sort of sort of the tone that that your film sorts sort of ends on is that question of there was this space where we had to hash out our differences. And um, I'm wondering if you could t talk a bit about that absence now, perhaps, of those sorts of spaces. Yeah, I mean, for me, what was really exciting about doing this film is the space that Justine uh, sort of created for that, because I feel like I'm often asked um, in my other work, you know, um, you know, what changes have you seen or has it hashtag gotten better? And I'm always like the Debbie Downer that's sort of like, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I got to just say that in this film. And I think, you know, for me, like one of the things that was important about the film too is I think at the core of a lot of my work is disturbing this idea that marginalization equals good. I think we have this idea that if you're queer, if you're racialized, you're somehow a good person because you've like 
been through the fire, you've emerged pure or something. And, you know, frankly, I, the most pain that I have had inflicted upon me has been by other marginalized people. And so, you know, the roost is not about, you know, honoring the roost isn't about taking away from the lessons that were taught, <laughs> so to speak, but thinking about what I miss is an opportunity to work through that. And I think in Toronto, my, see, I still say Toronto. <laughs> still one of you. <laughs> um, but in Toronto, like, you know, there is a kind of disposability in queer culture, you know, because we're so, excuse my language, but fucking spoiled here, where it's like, if you... If you have a fight with someone, you're like canceled, I'm gonna join a new group or you're not part of our group. And it's actually really devastating. And so for me, honoring the roost is also my low key uh, <laughs> subtweet at <of> Toronto <laughs> because I'm just like, look, we have so much here. We are so fortunate. Like I remember going to Chowdy. Sorry, I'm going to wrap this up very fast. I, I suddenly I was like, it's a Vivek Trey show. Um, <laughs> but I remember going. Do, 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 do any of you remember Chow Edies? Yes. I remember going to Chow Edies as a queer kid. Like it was one of the first places I came to, and I cried. I cried because I thought about like. I thought about being a brown queer kid in Edmonton with my lesbian best friend who was told we didn't belong at the roost. And you come to this city and you have so much here. We have so much here, but we don't know how to get along. And that to me, it's like, that's what's at the crux of my film, right? Is thinking about how do we find ways to take the amazing privilege that we have here and find a way to actually build upon it as opposed to like fracture. So, I mean, that's my rant. I will end here. I will pass on the mic. <laughs> I, I, just, to, just to pick up on that, you use the word cancel. And I mean, the visual strategy that I use in my film as well, um, that's sort of a sub thread for me is there's this, I see, this conversation happening in all kinds of different places where we're sort of struggling with the disposability, with the cancel culture, with people feeling like we don't listen to each other anymore. And, and that's what my film is. It's just, we're, we're all just listening to each other and trying to make space for us to think about um, what does it mean to slow down a little bit before you tweet or slow down a little bit before you react and, and listen. Like just, we need to really just listen to each other, I think. It's interesting when I was starting this, like I think that there's something around like also in Toronto where everyone is also very, you know, politicized as well and in the culture that almost makes me feel scared to ask the questions that might make me look like I have internalized homophobia. And I didn't realize that until making the bassinet and talking to Victoria about this and her telling me, oh, you shouldn't say that. Like it, it almost feels like, no, I love you, Vic, that was very supportive. I know, it's just that I didn't have the tools. I didn't realize that I didn't have the tools. Um, and then I also didn't realize that I didn't necessarily have a community where I felt like I could ask that or say that without feeling like, are you serious, Tiffany? Did you just ask that question? Like, and, it, and that to me stops the learning and stops this ability to actually grow and feel safe that you can be yourself and that you can understand like different communities and different groups to then feel like kind of welcomed into these spaces as well. Um, yeah, so I feel like that's something that I wanted to do with this film was that Culturally, you don't hear a lot about Chinese queerness in a way where, you know, you have to kind of negotiate between the two worlds. And I don't hear much about it. And I was scared to talk about it without offending gay, gay, my gay community as well as my family. And like, how do you balance the two and not wanting to do that? And, and that was always my, my pull between what I was saying and, and feeling uncomfortable between the two. And I realized that uncomfortableness comes from this, like being in this, I guess, in this community, in the society where it feels like I need to always say the right things, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And it was the biggest challenge was maybe it's okay not to say the right things mm -hmm. just so we could learn more through it. Yeah. Um, one more question, I'm gonna open it up to the audience. Um, 
Um, in thinking and reflecting then on the past, on this question of progress and change, um, I'm wondering if I could get um, some of you or all of you to reflect quickly on maybe what you think we could carry forward um, if we have this idea of reflecting back on the past and what's lost and and sort of you know thinking critically about what what does progress and change mean as we move forward as communities? Are there things that we can carry with us that we've learned from? from this perhaps ambivalence we might feel about progress, Thursa? Um, progress is a really weird word for mm. indigenous people. For sure. um, I think because progress is very colonial and um, you know, people think, oh, but, but it's so much better, like we're not homophobic now. It's like, well, homophobia and transphobia was like a colonial concept that was forced on us. And um, so in a lot of ways to me, it's like I don't really think so much about moving forward as like, finding things from history that were lost and bringing them back and honoring them again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Michael, maybe I'll pull you in before we open it up on that one. Well, uh, to maybe tie a few thoughts together, one of the, th I think the face of how our community is evolving is you know, the face has always been there, but what gets represented, it's been so white for so long. It's been very gay male for so long. And in my film, Otto's, who's the young uh, Chinese kid or Chinese Canadian, he said to me, I want to talk to another, like a Chinese elder. I've never talked to an older Chinese man in my life who is gay. And that was such a thrill to be able to make that possible. And I think the magic of this screening and these filmmakers, it's such a privilege to be amongst them because they're all doing work, creating new stories, telling new stories, and making the queer community be a polyverse. And so I deeply regret my Edmonton BC <laughs> joke be because it's exactly that kind of weird divisiveness. And really what I'm always trying to do is community build. And sometimes humor gets in the way of, you know, recognizing that, that you create, we've created these social divisions and we've created a kind of queer homogeny in the past, which is sort of like white feminism, right? In order to get ahead, a whole bunch of white feminists went out and made space and then didn't make space for everybody. And I feel like this is what we're learning. We're learning to undo and unlearn, as Jack Halberston says, make mistakes and say the wrong thing. And in that is, is such a, a broad range of knowledge and voices and magic. And here's evidence of that, right? Here's evidence of the evolution or the devolution of uh, queer identity and queer stories so that we're not just seeing a kind of homogeny, we're seeing the real richness and vibrancy of what we can do as queer people in the world. And it's thrilling, there's huge magic happening right now. Thank you. Um, so I wanna open it up to all of you. I don't know if there are mics, yeah, there's folks with mics. So if you um, grab their attention, if we could have a brave volunteer to be the first person to ask the question. Any, any hands up? Um, well, while we're waiting. <laughs> oh, is there a hand? There's a hand. Thank you. Oh, right beside you. Hi there. Um, lovely movies. Uh, thank you so much. Um, do you feel like at any point you felt restricted in, in getting your point across? And like, how did you navigate that? Like, like even thinking about, oh, am I going to offend someone? Or is it like the right thing? Am I like toning down what I'm actually trying to convey? Like, did you have those kind of moments? And how did you overcome that? Um, I think for me, probably just like community responsibility like I wouldn't say get in the way, but it was something I had like really at like the front of my mind when I was making this film, just because you know like there's like the two spirit community is very small, but like 
you know, is you just feel responsible for that community and like for telling a story properly. And there were things I did in this film that, you know, like the larger, well, particularly the Plains, like Saskatchewan Indigenous community, like looked down on, like um, the drum group in that was like a big drum group and it was a women's big drum group. And in Saskatchewan, women aren't supposed to go near the big drum. So even just having that in there was like kind of, um, I, we'll see what people say, but um, yeah. So, I mean, I think too, like just trying to think about gender and like pre-contact gender and, and like, you know, there's words we use now like two spirit and trans and queer, and we didn't use those words like in the past. So um, yeah, looking at history and then trying to talk about it now, it's, it's challenging. Um, I had actually one of my biggest supporters in making the bassinet was my mother. And uh, when I actually, she was the one who actually helped me talk about kind of this idea of shame and, and also swallowing the bitter. And it was through talking to her where she was like, these are the things that I, like examples of me swallowing the bitter. And it was actually her telling me the various things. And I was actually scared to put that out, like something so personal for her. And I was like, oh my God, mom, I even felt like, would you feel embarrassed if I said that? Like talk about how we went to the shelter. And she's like, fuck it, no. Like <laughs> I'm I'm amazing and I'm resilient, I'm strong. And, I'm, and so she actually taught me through her telling me that story and giving me that permission to share it, to really nail down what swallowing the bitter really means, you know? And it is so complex and so nuanced. So, um, that was like my biggest thing for me was to not offend my family. Even still at this, like that's been my ongoing journey is like to figure out how much space to take and to make sure everyone feels good. And and so it was always important to touch base with my family. So I appreciated that, that helped me tremendously. Great. Another question? And also, if you f any of the filmmakers want to ask each other questions, too. <laughs> yeah, the guy in the crowd wants you to ask me the question. The mic's coming. Just hang on one sec, and then if you have the mic, then that's fine. I spent some time really seriously discussing and talking about the difference in between storytelling and pamphlet in our, in our workshop, and the importance of when you make a story to talk to people who only look like you and dress like you and are like a reflection of you, or when you take the story beyond that to advance the conversation and to go, because our films can also be in forums. And I see how these stories have grown into that terrain of, matur of maturity that it wasn't about, fuck you, it was really about compassion also. And I think that's very beautiful. Thank you. Someone can oh, run up the back. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> my brain's not working. I just rushed here from Hamilton to catch my sister's film, but I missed it. Sorry, Tiffany. Um, I just wanted wait, to wait, wait. <laughs> Are you about to do what I think you're about to do? No, I'm not. Apologize for outing me 18 years <laughs> oh ago God. from the family. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't you say that I ripped the Band-Aid off? Like, you know, <laughs> okay, we'll get into this some other time. Uh, my point is, I don't think many people are aware of this. Um, Tiffany talked about Chinese culture, Asian culture, being very kind of, sex was always a very taboo subject matter. So things such as homosexuality, even concepts such as rape, molestation, anything sexual was never openly spoken about at home. And it might give you some context to understand that, but up until 2008, in China, homosexuality was listed as a mental illness, as a disease. Like, to me, that's shocking. And if you can imagine all the people in China, over a billion people, and how many people must be gay, but couldn't come out. And so I think, when we look at movies these days and television shows, I, I think I'm trying to say is like, is there a fine line between exploitation and representation? Because I feel like what's happening right now in Hollywood is you're seeing a lot more cultural representation and you are seeing representation probably earlier 
with LGBTQ films. But at some point you're also like, okay, well, how much is this now just like a commercial thing? Like I think Crazy Rich Asians was not very, like it was great because it was the first box office like movie for you know, Asian people in a lead, like a romantic comedy, but at the same time, it was also very surface and very digestible for people. So I'm th asking, I guess, to the filmmakers up there, it's like when you see shows like, you know, Queer Eye for the Straight Guy, sorry, I'm not even, or like Drag Race or things like these, like these television shows, do you feel like it's a good representation or do you think that like people in the industry are just like, okay, there's a market now and we can capitalize on it? And is there a problem with that? Thanks. I don't know. Thanks. Who wants to leap in? Sorry, that was like just just to clarify. Did you miss all the films? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I'm just giving you a hard time. <laughs> um, you know, the truth is, I mean, it's such a good question, and I wrestle with this so much. But like, I think it's both, right? Like, I think that. You know, there are a lot of people, like I have queer friends who fucking love Queer Eye for the whatever guy. Like I don't, like I don't even know, that, like, like people just really love that show. And there's another part of me that's like, wow, this is what we are getting behind. Like this is what, as a community, like this is what we're interested in. Like, I, like that's my feeling about it. So, I mean, I think the issue is, um, you know, the issue that I run into, if I may, is that like, I'm sort of forced to tell a particular kind of narrative. And I think that that's, that's the thing that really irritates me is I think that, um, you know, there's this push around diversification and representation, but like the way that capitalism and institutions understand that is by being like, you're gay, now tell us a gay story. And it's like, well, but there's so many stories that we're interested in telling. So, uh, you know, is there is it possible for you to give us the space to tell stories that aren't just about my transition or, you know, what it was like for my Im immigrant parents in this country? And again, I think those stories are really important and I've made my share of them, but I don't know. I think that, you know, to answer your question, I, I do think part of the issue isn't so much just that they want to make money off of it, but it's that that we that they see us as one dimensional because, you know, as an artist, like I want to get paid, <laughs> quite frankly. So, I mean, like the capital, the you know, the capitalist system, that's like a whole other conversation. It's just I, I would rather get paid to tell a story that I'm actually genuinely interested in telling as opposed to telling a one dimensional story about how hard my life has been. Does, I don't know, if does that answer your question? Are we okay? I feel like I low-key shamed you, but like, <laughs> like no, we're, we're okay, okay. You got her back, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> well, that's one of the reasons why I really like shorts programs is because I feel like it it's less capitalist in a lot of ways. Like it doesn't buy into the system. You can't sell them quite as easily. And what you get is you, you often get very personal stories you maybe they're not as nuanced because they're short and you can't get in deep, but um, you you get the, these really nice snapshots of people working with reasonably low budgets, making telling their own individual little story. And some of my best film experiences have been going to out on screen or inside out and sitting in a movie theater and watching these magic stories that you've never seen anybody like that on screen before and how thrilling it is to see people telling their own stories. And that's the real thrill of shorts programs. Shorts just, they, they just give you that ability because you can make a film and slap it up. And so I think if you're hot for this, if this is what you're into, take 200 bucks and uh, friends and buy, the, buy them food for the weekend and make your movie and put it online and tweet it out. It's such a great way of sharing it is. It's such a great way of sharing stories. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, I think there was one. Was there one more person? Oh, there's someone right here. And I think there was somebody right at the very back too. But maybe um, there's somebody right. Uh, yeah, pass it along. And then I feel like I saw a hand at the very back after that. We've only got about. F okay. Thank you. Um, sometimes with uh, short formats or. Formats that have constraints, there is an opportunity with those within those limitations to uh, break through and and have you know happy accidents occur or um, 
I, just, I wondered if anyone on the panel could talk about whether or not the constraints of making a short film with limited budget and, and all the other constraints that might be um, abiding, I wondered if that gave rise to any um, magical breakthrough moments in storytelling for anyone up there. Anyone want to leap in? Should I just jump in? Is that okay? I don't know. I feel like I've talked a lot. <laughs> I mean, first of all, what a great question. Who are you? Like, that's such a like thoughtful. Oh, okay. That's, what a nice question. I really like that question. Um, yes, actually. So, I mean, for me, the biggest challenge was how do you make an interesting five minute short about a, a bar that doesn't exist, that's owned by the fucking police, where we like, how are we can't go in and put in strobe lights? And you know, like it's just not going to happen. And so I think this was like the challenge that like Ricardo and Justine, like we just sort of like went through like a number of different ways to tell the story. And suddenly we landed on animation. And for me, like it just really like opened up the like the possibility of of what the story could be because suddenly we weren't bound to the building and like recreate, we got to re, well, Tim recreated the building and the story and the, the emotion through animation. So yes, very much. And I mean, Justine will attest to the fact from the beginning, I was like, I can't do this unless the building's in it. Like a building has to be in a building. I will be out. Like the original idea was like me going to dance outside the building. Cause I'm like, well, <laughs> queer people, we just find our spaces. And it was going to be like, I was going to dance in like a silver thing outside the building. And it's just like, but this isn't interesting. Like nobody wants to see that. You did well, say you I had never moves. said that. Well, I mean, I, <laughs> I just you mean what I, say what I, that. I never said that. You never said that, but in my mind, I was like, nobody needs to see that. <laughs> I think shorts are so hard to make. Like, I I have so much respect now for short film film like not short film yeah short not short filmmakers <laughs> short filmmakers. No, just coming from um, you know doing <laughs> the apology in the future and having that space to grow and you know know that you have some time to to be able to explain and to share. Um, five minutes was really, really challenging, and I struggled the most of not feeling like, oh, are people going to get this? Oh, this is like, I need to put more, I need to put more. But I think it taught me a lot about, like, discipline, basically, the discipline to really hone in on one thought and to go from there and to realize that actually what's really neat about shorts is, like, it's it plants a seed. And I think that that's really special is that you plant a seed for viewers to then either they take it on to make something else or have that conversation, but it doesn't need to be exactly, you know, an hour and a half or two hours. So it, it taught me that in a new way of looking and how we can share stories in like these bite sized pieces that are, you know, very powerful and very personal as well. It is possible. I didn't think it was. As somebody that's made features, produced features most of my career and um, you know, have done several shorts now s since being a producer at the NFB. I mean, it, they're inc they're an incredible learning process. I you know, and they're a ton of work. <laughs> just saying, you know, that people think that somehow shorts are easier than a feature, or you know, they're just um, and, and but rich in terms of uh, creative learning in doing them. Um, you know, the the learning is incredible, and uh, to try to condense. Uh, you know, the themes and the story into that kind of small, compact storytelling, you know. So, you know, it, it was wonderful. And I learned so much, you know, from each 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 uh, creative process of each of the films. I think what, there's a person at the very, very back. Um, we'll grab you. I think this will be our last question before we have to wrap. Thanks. Um, this question's for Michelle, but... It could certainly be answered by a lot of people. Um, I know you said that you um, that your work is often about grief and loss. I also think it's about vulnerability, which queerness and vulnerability just kind of go hand in hand. But I was wondering, like, kind of building on this idea of um, bringing things down to like a, a kernel or an idea, is, I was wondering if you wanted to talk a little bit about the gesture and the way in which you focus in on the gesture and repetition. Um, in your in your piece to kind of talk about what you're after, but maybe others want to also chime in on like the kernels that they focus in on as a framing device. Um, thanks for that question. Um, I, for me, 
my biggest challenge was the the constraint of the five minutes because I had two to three hour conversations with you know each of the the couples that I spoke with, um, and I was trying to think about how do I pack so much listening like there's a lot of voice, um, and how do I visually support um, that experience of listening to so much that's jumping from voice to voice. Um, and the more I focused on listening, I just, there's just so much emotion in gesture. Um, and because people are, you don't have people's facial expression as they're seeing what they're seeing. And so the repetition of gesture was a way to try to bring forth visually um, the emotion. Um, and because I'm speaking to six friends who were invested, you know, the conversation were people who were invested in my marriage as well as invested in gay marriage as queers themselves. Um, and for me, because my film, you know, we were not in the streets uh, protesting or raising money and signing petitions for gay divorce, right? Um, and even though that comes along with it, uh, I really felt that leading up to getting that right, we talked about this issue ad nauseum and then 15 years in, we don't talk about it anymore. Um, and even to ask people to talk to me about it and, and, and listen to me and to me listen to them, there was just so much tenderness and emotion required and part of that process. Um, and to boil six hours of all of that emotion down, gesture and repetition became a way to try to bring that to the film as much as I could. I think we have to wrap now. So um, before we go, um, uh, please tell your friends that these um, that you can see all of these films um, as of tomorrow on the NFB site and as of Thursday on um, Extra. Um, so please let people know that they can they can see this work. I know um, Justine had mentioned that she really feels it's important to have these as as archives, these these films as an archive of this particular moment and this moment of reflection. And so, on behalf of everyone, um, I want to thank these extraordinary filmmakers for their for their work and for their conversation and for their insights and for all of you um, for coming out tonight. I don't know, Justine, if you had any closing remarks on behalf of NFB or? Uh, just uh, exactly like you said, they're gonna be at nfb.ca and if uh, you use the hashtag five at 50 and please spread the word, uh, you know, share them with your communities and they're, uh, they're online and um, yeah, we're really excited to uh, share them with the world. So thank you very much for everybody coming and thank you again to all of you.